Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 454, featuring the final installment of my interview with Mr. Brian Hines. In this segment, we talk a little bit more about tyranny, and then we get into South Park Stick of Truth. Uh, we talk about crowdfunding, the, uh, what makes comedy in games more difficult than in other genres, and we take a few questions from George Zeitz about Brian's early days in the games industry. A lot of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Brian Hines. I just want everybody to like me. <laughs> There's actually a one review of Tyranny that I love where the reviewer is basically saying, like, I played the game trying to get everyone to like, like me, and I never felt worse about myself. <laughs> like, that's kind of the result, yes. <laughs> Well, again, with this game, we're, we're, you're sort of bucking that old class system and making some pretty big uh, different. We made some pretty big changes from Pillars, mm -hmm. you know, of Eternity. So you kind of talk, talked about this already, but is there a particular change or mechanic that you really wanted to see change from Pillars? So one of it. Uh, so when we first started working on Tyranny, um, Pillars was still like midway through development, so there were a lot of systems that hadn't been implemented yet or fully defined so some things we were trying to figure out okay what is it going to end up being versus what is it uh at currently in the current build we're playing um definitely uh pillars was going for the the class-based system like trying to recreate like the the classic baldur's gate um D, D experience and we wanted to like my own personal like preference is going for something that is like more skill-based as opposed to class-based. So I wanted to push more in that direction. And I wanted to go something where it was basically a use-based skill system where your skills improved at, by the actions you took in the game. Um, that's one of those decisions that if I could go back years from years ago and change, I would definitely change that just because we didn't have time to balance it as effectively as I would have liked. So certain skills are much easier to raise than others based on just opportunities and the overall skill values. Um, we just didn't have the manpower to do the amount of tuning I would have liked for that. Um, but I think it definitely did help set the game apart from Pillars because we wanted, with you having the role of, of, of Fatebinder being like a leader in this army, we still wanted you to be able to define what type of leader or what type of, of character you're going to be. So we wanted to definitely focus more on skills as opposed to class for that. And one of the, the systems that I'm actually proudest of with Tyranny is the magic system. Um, I I am not a fan of the D&D memorized spell magic system at all. I, I definitely wanted to do something different. So the, um, like the, the magic system is actually one of the systems I'm most proud of having designed and worked on for Tyranny, being able like, to, to craft spells and make them and customize them and to make them your own as you're as you're playing through the game. Like that's something that I I would love to like flesh out further and give even more opportunities. But I think it's one that I think definitely sets the game apart and makes it feel different than than a lot of other games out there. Yeah, absolutely, it's great. Now, one of the and one of the things that's Brian, I'm wondering about you know hearing, hearing you talk about some of these games. Now, are you are you the type of guy? Given a choice, would you like to go back and like make a director's cut or revisit like existing games, or would or would you be more like, no, I've been there, done that. I I need something fresh. Uh, if you ask me, like within the six months of the game releasing, I'd be like, um, <laughs> want fresh. after a few years, I'd be happy to go back and work on something, just because I think by the time a game comes out, you've been living with it for multiple years and you've gone through all of the, the pain and angst of trying to get all the decisions right and getting the game released that at a certain point, you just want people to play it and like get the feedback and see if they're like, they're enjoying it and like what good or bad, whether it's flawed or whether it's like, it's fantastic. You just want to see people actually experiencing the game because you've been, been held so close for so long that this is really now the chance, like 
set it out there and see people actually play it. Like, honestly, one of the like the uh, the advent of like streaming games over the past several years has been fantastic because you're actually able to watch people play the game you've made and see their honest reactions in the moment to choices and decisions and seeing how they how they're reacting how they're what choices they make and you that's twirl, awesome. you twirl your mustache during those what's that <laughs> gets you twirling your mustache with watching someone. Sometimes. <laughs> oh, I got you there <laughs> and definitely when uh, when tyranny released when pillars released like we all, like a lot of people on the team spent a lot of time watching streamers play through the game to see what their reactions were to various moments that must be just a trip it really is <laughs> one last thing about tyranny if you don't mind mm-hmm. uh, there was a lot of talk about uh, the kickstarter or rather i guess i should say the the lack <laughs> the decision not to uh, go with kickstarter <laughs> just you know just as somebody who writes books about the genre of not just a mm-hmm. role-playing game so i'm just kind of fascinated by the idea of crowdfunding and the impact it has i mean yeah you get a game funded but you know as you've pointed out it kind of comes with some strings Yes, uh, attached definitely. it's not just a check right yeah uh, and then of course the publishers likewise they kind of get a bad reputation for whatever reason but really they're not you know that they do what they do <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. uh so what do you what do you think about the effects that kickstarter has had on the industry well i think it's definitely i mean i don't think games like pillars or tyranny would have been made without kickstarter without that uh I, right now, like the the I almost call it a fad, but that the method of raising money has kind of it's no longer as uh, successful as it was. Like that that peak has been reached, and now we're uh, not get that's not really happening as much anymore. But for a while there, there were a ton of games that genres publishers had said were dead and were no longer put money towards that were getting made again, and people were buying and enjoying and loving again. So like. I was able to, uh, like, because of Pillars of Eternity, I gave my nephew, who played nothing but but Halo, and like, got him a, uh, like a key to the game. He played it, and now he plays D&D with his friends. So nice. it's definitely, like, it's it's a gateway drug to nerdism. So I, I approve of that. Um, That's How many, why do people think that the RPG is dead? I, I, I was just going back through some old magazines from the 90s, and I kept seeing that. Mm-hmm. Well, I think a lot of it is like you see a lot of games now that have RPG elements to the point that one of like the the joke marketing tags for Outer Worlds was an RPG with RPG elements. <laughs> an games... RPG with RPG elements. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think uh, Kickstarter I think was is great for a lot of teams that have an idea and are passionate about it and don't need a ton of money. They just need a little bit to help them get some art resources or get some audio resources or just get an audience that they can then use to build a following behind a game and help them make the second, the next game and the game after that. So that type of crowdfunding I think is incredibly value valuable for a certain size of game. There's just no way it can scale up to things like the outer worlds or other like uh, large scale um, games that have a much higher production value. It's just, you can't, except for the the odd star citizens out yes, there, thing can't star raise citizens. that much money. <laughs> well, they have to about six billion now. Eh? Way, way more. It's insane. <laughs> well, there is a PR element to it too, right? You put it on a Kickstarter, you get a lot of buzz. But oh yeah, I mean, there was uh, for the the original Pillars Kickstarter, there was a lot of work that the the, the team did to maintain engagement with the fans and the backers to provide updates and not just updates about what was going on, but updates that were entertaining and would help like evangelize the game to a larger audience as well. So there was a significant amount of time was spent by the team on that level of engagement um, with the product. So it's definitely, yeah, the, the, the Kickstarter money has a lot of, cost with it that you may not expect if you're just looking at like oh yeah we can use all the money to fund the game like you got to send some of that money for like engaging with fans and i mean if you've decided to do any kind of physical backer goods 
don't. <laughs> don't do it. Don't do it. I've heard some folks I've had on say that the Kickstarter thing was actually a lot more stressful than making the game. In some ways, it is like because sometimes when you're just like, focusing on the game, like it's decisions that you're used to making, even as stressful as they could be. It's like you're, it's it's the core of the job that you want to do, versus being more of like the like working on a Kickstarter. Essentially, is like marketing and PR, which not a lot of us are good at and probably shouldn't be doing. So, uh, it definitely is a different skill set than actually developing the game. All right. Well, let's get into South Park. Uh, the Stick Excellent. of Truth, great game. Wow, just uh, phenomenal. Uh, I remember when that game came out and people that were, even people that didn't play or didn't watch South Park or weren't fans of that were like, man, you got to check this out. It's just a good role-playing game. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just good mechanics. It's and That's just something that, I don't know, if, there's probably like five games that you could say that about, right? They're based on a big franchise. and they're, they're, they People would love to play them even without the, you yeah. know, the licensed content, so... Yeah, yeah. So, what do you what, looking back on that game? What what sort of stands out to you? Uh, it's well, it's interesting because I I worked on I did both area design and system design on the game. Um, it's the game I worked on where most of the things I worked on got censored. So that's, <laughs> what? That's a, I worked on a lot of mini games. That so takes some talent like there. The, the alien probing and various other mini games that were all censored in like the PlayStation versions in Europe and Australia. Like, so not only did I have to like implement the actual mini games themselves, I had to go back and create versions of those that would display like the censored screens for those censored <laughs> versions. So that was, uh, probably to date, like the, uh, like, the game I say where the stuff I worked on didn't get cut, it just got censored for certain regions, which was interesting. That is weird. Was there any pat? I remember talking to some of the Lucas film, uh, like some of the Lucas film guys. Mm-hmm. They were talking about some of this stuff. Like I remember Mani- uh, Manic Mansion, Maniac Mansion. They had to censor a bunch of stuff with the hamster mm-hmm. and the. <laughs> they- one thing that struck me was just it was so random. Like the stuff they would ask you to censor. I mean, was was it like that for you, or was it stuff like, well, okay, yeah, I can see why. Well, I think it was definitely it's it's one of those things that I think Matt and Trey knew was going to be an issue, so they had things they were going to put in the game that they knew they would they wanted to take out to, in order to buy keeping other things in. So, like when the game was sent to the the ratings boards for for uh, evaluation, and we come back with like an adults only <laughs> rating, it's like. Well, what? what if we don't do this? Can we get it mature if we just take these things out that they already wanted to remove from the game anyway? So it was definitely yeah, a little strategy. interesting to that happening, yeah. <laughs> uh, here's a question from Alan about uh, South Park. It says, what's it like being a lead creative on a project where someone else has the creative reins of the IP? It must be a strange creative process. Well, I mean, I wasn't uh, a lead on South Park. I was I did area design and uh, system design. Um, the lead designer was uh, Matt McLean, and Charles Staples was lead area designer on the project. So I can't speak specifically about like being lead creative in that. I will say it was a very different experience for a lot of the like Obsidian team because, I mean, rightly so, Matt and Trey are very protective of their IP. Mm-hmm. South Park is the thing that they are most known for most, like very successful and they had not had great experiences with previous South Park games. So they really wanted to be involved in making sure that stick of truth felt like an actual South Park game, not just a license, the South Park licensed game. So there was definitely a Certainly lot of that. Definitely. I mean, I think uh, the, the feedback we got from them was really essential to being able to hit that because Nobody knows their IP the way they do. Just, it's just not possible. They've lived with it for so long. They like made make episode after episode of that of that show. Like there is no way anybody coming in is going to be able to capture the tone and feel the way they just inherently know it. Um, which I think also like on the development side, occasion would be frustrating because we'd like we'd have, we'd propose ideas that we thought were funny, and it's like, nah, that's not South Park. <laughs> so. I think that like uh, being a creative person on the team could get very frustrating because it felt like you weren't being creative. It felt like you were more just implementing stuff. But 
I think we all learn to find creativity within the constraint. Again, going back to what I said earlier, like when you have constraints, it helps focus your creativity. I think with South Park that we all learned that, okay, this is just a different set of constraints. We have to find ways to like, to focus our own creativity within. So we all got there, which is a very different experience getting there in the long run. <laughs> Along those la- same lines, here's a question from Nathan. Mm-hmm. Uh, Talbert, how much influence did Matt and Trey have on slowing down the process of finishing the Stick of Truth? It was delayed uh, for quite a while. Uh, I'm just curious if he feels that, if, if you feel that due to their uh, obsessive nature, uh, that it impacted the time frame or were there other issues? I mean, I wouldn't say they have an obsessive nature. I think they definitely... Yeah, I mean, yeah it's kind of their baby, right? I mean... <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's their IP. They've made it. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, I think that phrasing is probably not, like, uh, not accurate, but they definitely wanted to make sure the game, again, was a South Park game. At the same time, they weren't dedicated just to working on the game. They also had the show that they had to make episodes for. They were creating Book of Mormon at the same time that Stick of Truth was uh, in development. And there was, I think, one other project they were involved with as well. So their, their time was spread wow, very must be just high so voltage. I, there were definitely periods like when the show was running where like we would go for months without, uh, without really seeing them or getting feedback from them. And then they would kind of, the show was done they'd take a break and then come back and look at the game. And then a lot of things would change. Like one of the, the struggles we had is like, I I don't know if you've seen the documentary six days to air. It's about making an episode of, of South park. They essentially make an episode within six days. So game development timelines are much longer than six days. So I think for them, it was hard to live with a joke that long that it would get, they would get bored of it very, um, after a month or two months and think it wasn't funny anymore, which a new player was still going to like be amused by the joke and laugh at it, but they were ready to try something different. So that led to a lot of iteration, a lot of changes in the content. Or we'd be working on the game and the series would be airing and they were struggling to find a joke that week, so they grabbed one of the jokes from the game and we'd see the joke wow. air in the episode. And the next day would be like, Okay, yeah, you guys got to cut that. We can't have that what? game. <laughs> so that was that was definitely a struggle. It's kind of a compliment, um, though, in a way, right? Well, I mean, a lot of times there, there were jokes that they had. Oh, they written. wrote the joke. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they uh, took the joke. Um, <laughs> oh, pretty much well. motion. Sound like you need a documentary made about making the game. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was like definitely a different experience working with them. I mean, honestly, the uh, like. The uh, publisher going bankrupt had more to do with the game getting delayed. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> um, definitely had an impact a little bit. So, uh, um, but once like Ubisoft picked up picked up the IP and worked with the with South Park, definitely um, we were able to make a lot uh, more forward progress and strides on finishing the game. Well, here's a question from Matt Shergi. Well, this is uh, you know he's, he, his question is why isn't there more comedy? Why isn't comedy in more RPGs? Uh, so that's something I've wondered about too. But also the kind of what we were talking about before with the as a game developer, you program this joke, <laughs> implement it, you <laughs> it probably stops being funny pretty quickly. But yet you know you've probably heard it a billion times, right? I mean, mm-hmm. but you still don't know really how anybody else is going to respond to it for months. Well, it's, I mean, yeah, writing comedy is hard. It's harder than any other writing, I would say. Um, I think it's, it's especially hard because, so the way Obsidian works is we'll have, um, we'll write dialogue and then we use a, a text-to-speech um, generator to generate our, our robo-VO to get like the actual like VO lines in the game and the, the web wave files, which we need to have for like, for memory, making sure things are being loaded correctly, that are named accurately, that sort of thing. But there is nothing that kills a joke faster than hearing it read by a robotic <laughs> voice. It's just, yeah. it's death to humor. So there's a lot of times in like working on Outer Worlds where we, we would be playing through something and it's like, oh, that joke didn't land. But then when we got an actual voice actor to deliver the line like six months, a year later, it's hysterical because they actually apply intonation and a performance to the line. So 
definitely I would say it's just incredibly hard and humor is very subjective. Mm -hmm. And I think doing something, uh, especially like if you want to do something slapstick, well, that adds animation cost and resources <laughs> onto everything. Um, doing anything that's, that's topical, games take so long to release that the topic has gone stale by the time it's come out. By the time the game has been released, so it's hard to find a good type of humor that will age well with the game and will still be doable within your resources and budget. So, I think a lot of games don't do it because it's. Making game is hard enough without adding humor on top of it. It's yeah, complicated. I think it's a great, you know, the more I think about it, just it's a great question. Now I hear stand up comics even will talk about, well, I don't do the same routine every night because you got to read the crowd and you have to see what works. Yep. And it might be the same set of jokes doesn't the work killed the night before. Now it's people that are <laughs> yep. falling asleep. <laughs> I mean, I might yeah, imagine it must be like 10 times harder with a game. It was also like, again, like watching, uh, talking about streamers watching, like playing the Outer Worlds. There'd be times I'd be watching a stream where I hit a joke that everyone else laughs at, and they look at it like, that wasn't funny. It's like, well, not to you, but it was to somebody. <laughs> what do you think's the, the funniest joke in there? Oh. God, now I'm blanking. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I found. Uh, so one of the companions in the game was Felix. Um, he was written by one of our writers, Natai. I just find him, he's like an adorable meathead. He's just kind of like dumb and goofy. I just found a lot of his, uh, like his humor just, just made me crack up and laugh. It's like there was one uh, uh, on the groundbreaker. If you talk to the head of security with Felix in your party, um, he'll be like sassy and mouthing off to her. And she's, she'll be like, look, I've got a cell back there with your name on it. And he's like, it's true. I carved my name myself. <laughs> that just made me die laughing when i first read it because it just the way that he'd uh, he'd phrase it the way the actor delivered it was just perfect so all right we got one last question here this is another one from george uh, zeitz oh <laughs> this is also think it would be fun to ask about his recollections of earth and beyond uh, since both he and i were on that project and what was it like making the transition from mmos to obsidian style RPGs. <laughs> so we're going a little further back with this one. Yeah, I mean, Earth and Beyond released in 2001, 2002? Somewhere around there, yeah. Earth and Beyond. <laughs> That's a cool title. <laughs> it was the, uh, that was my first full time official job in the game industry, was working on Earth and Beyond. Before that, I'd worked on. Uh, uh, smaller online games for a company called Simutronics um, back on the like AOL text-based adventure games, <laughs> RPGs. Um, How'd you so get started with Westbrook, those? You just, went straight, you just went straight to the uh, to the MMO space, I guess. From Yeah, so I basically, I played those games when I was in, in high school, and I was fairly active on, on the forums. Like, I would honestly, like, being a little brat criticizing the some of the design oh, decisions in the game. That guy. Yes, I was that guy. And then uh, like one of the developers like liked some of my suggestions and said, "Hey, we're going to have an opening coming up in a few months." And I was like, "Well, I don't turn 18 <laughs> until until that time anyway." So I actually applied, uh, got a job working remotely effectively. So like my well, you got a uh, job by criticizing. <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> Wow, it was. I mean, but it was. You must have made some pretty good points, I guess, to get you might impress them. I think it was just like a certain amount of the volume of posting helped. <laughs> <laughs> there was a, uh, enough little moments in there that uh, that worked that they remembered. Um, yeah, it was fantastic. Like it was a great first job because I had a lot of opportunities to to play effectively. I could because it was text based. There wasn't like constraints of art resources or audio resources or all the other like departments that you have to worry about as a designer of like oh yes you have this idea and that's generated six months of work for everyone else no we can't do that <laughs> try and find like another way to make it work so i was able to just like create a ton of stuff all on my own and just get it out to players and see like what went well what failed what bombed and why did it fail and bomb and, like just kind of 
like refine and like learn like what good principles of design were. Yeah, just kind of, it sounds like a great way to learn the trade, really. It was fantastic. Like I kind of wish more like the, that style of opportunity still existed because I think more people could benefit from just like jumping in and doing stuff and getting feedback. Like I think one of the great things about like, the modding community for games right now is like it gives people a chance to try small things and get real feedback from players about like what works and what does what doesn't. So they can really like just see like oh, okay, it was great in my head, but it, like it doesn't come at these five types of players, and causes this huge exploit for this type of player. So I have to completely change the way I think about things. Um, so yeah, after working there for four years while I was going through through college, um, when I graduated college, I started at Westwood. What did you um, major working... in at college, by the way? Uh, I was a computer science. Computer science. Major. Yeah, um, which my Parents thought I was going to lead to like a, like a career making tons of money working for IBM or something like that. And then I decided to go make games instead, and they were very disappointed in me. Uh... <laughs> they changed their tune since then, but for a while it was not, uh, not the best choice. Yeah, let's see. Um, but yeah, uh, so then I went to Westwood um, working on Earth and Beyond, which is like the first Great studio. for real game job. Yeah, at an actual studio. Um, it was great getting to work like so the, the people who had made command and conquer and uh lands of lore and blade runner and like a lot of games that i loved playing growing up so getting to work with a lot of those people and learn from them was fantastic and uh basically yeah i was there through development of earth and beyond and then ea shut down westwood and then got to work at uh, uh ea redwood shores for a while on finishing the game out and on a few other uh, online games that were started and never finished by EA at the time. So, quite a few of those. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a period where, uh, well, at the time, EverQuest was the the big kid on the block as far as subscriber numbers, and everyone wanted to make the next EverQuest until WoW came along and like completely outpaced EverQuest, and now everyone wanted to make the the next WoW the next WoW killer. Um, but for a while, like. Uh, a lot of the games that were being made, the people didn't get that. Like, it takes time to build a subscriber base. So when a game released and didn't immediately have um, EverQuest's numbers or WoW's numbers, publishers would give up and kill the kill the project rather than letting it grow over time. So, um, for example, Earth and Beyond was released at the same time as EVE Online. EVE Online is still going, still making money. Um, Earth and Beyond actually released with, at the time, higher subscriber numbers than EVE Online and could have been a huge success if, maybe, who knows, if uh, more had been invested into uh, development for it. Well, thanks for taking the time, Brian. This has been an awesome chat. And Absolutely. I've covered a lot of ground here. Was there anything else that... <laughs> you know, it's one of the things I like to ask folks, uh, like you especially, is what, what advice you might have for us young college student 18 looking for looking for a way in well i think honestly the the right now you have opportunities with downloading unreal or unity and making mods making levels like the best thing that will get you in the door is a solid portfolio um a lot of times we will see people who will apply for internships or entry-level positions who don't have anything that they've made themselves and honestly if you have two candidates who even if they have equivalent level of resumes one has a portfolio showing like solid work and one doesn't like what kind of stuff do you like to see in a portfolio um finished stuff um we're if, the only thing worse than no portfolio is a portfolio with finished or with unfinished or broken stuff so definitely uh like if you want to work on levels get me make me a small level that's like you can get assets from the asset store you can do some simple lighting just like show me a good gameplay space mm -hmm. show me a simple quest line or npc interaction if you want to be a mechanics designer do a cool combat layout like make a new weapon scripted in unreal like there's so many opportunities to showcase what your talents and abilities are that can get people excited and just make sure it's a playable demo that can be downloaded with unity unreal something that's already out there like uh, occasionally we'll get people who are like oh yeah I've, I've created my own game and compiled my own code here install and run this executable and it's like 
honestly, our security systems don't allow us to do that most of the time. So we can't yeah. actually do that in a lot of a lot of cases. So I think there's definitely looking at the the free resources that are out there are so much more prevalent now than they were when I was a kid trying to like get a job in the industry. So it's definitely much more both more competitive and you also have more opportunities to show what you can really do. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, a lot of great stuff coming up. A lot of uh, good plans, uh, suggestions. Actually, ask uh, the folks on Patreon and Twitter and all the other usual places. You know, like, what are some of your ideas? What are some things you'd like to see on the show? And I'm actually kind of excited about some of those uh, suggestions that have come uh, to me. Uh, a lot of uh, really fun ideas. I think would make it for some fun episodes. I might try some of those. Uh, try some of those ideas out. We'll see how it shakes out. Uh, and of course, you know, future guests, you know, we're always in some stage of negotiation with folks, got some ideas. And, you know, if there's people you would like to see on the show, if you have uh, some way to, for me to get in touch with them, please pass that along. You know, I'm always happy to reach out and see who will will come on. You know, I like to have these, uh, <laughs> you know, a wide variety of guests. You know, it's, we've been doing a lot of RPG stuff lately. But, you know, if you, uh, you know, there's a lot of great adventure game designers I haven't had on. A lot of great uh, DOS era Amiga developers. I mean, the list goes on and on. <laughs> uh, we could do this forever, uh, but I need your help to do it. So, as always, thank you, thank you very, very much. If you have supported the show, if you currently support the show, thank you for that. Uh, you know, a lot of people are having, uh, you know, a terrible time as it is. I don't know when you'll be watching these uh, you know, episodes. <laughs> you know, for all I know, you're watching this years from now. Uh, I don't even know what I'm talking about, but basically, you know, a lot of people have had, for various reasons, to uh, cancel or reduce their, you know, patron patronage of the show, and that's certainly had an impact. Uh, so I just would ask if, you know, if you're in a good position, if you don't have any problems right now, uh, this would be a great time for you to step up to the plate uh, to keep these episodes coming. You know, I, I definitely need your help uh, to do that. So thank you very, 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 <laughs> it's about to give out, sorry. Uh, but thank you for your support of the show. really means a lot to me. All right, what about that news from the Matt Cave? Okay, uh, first up is some pretty cool news. If you are a fan, or maybe you're not a fan, of uh, World of Warcraft, there is an expansion coming out soon. Well, I don't know about soon, you know, <laughs> at some point, uh, called Shadowlands. And the reason I thought this was newsworthy is that they're trying to adjust the paradigm again. They're trying to make it less like an MMORPG and more like a just a regular RPG again. Uh, basically giving you more of an impact on the story, more choices to make. Uh, there's, co there's a covenant you uh, will pick, and then you get abilities that go along with that. Uh, there's some talk about maybe this approach might not be so good because it might lock you out of some of those other options, some of those other paths. You know, a lot of people that play these games like to see everything, you know, on their main character. Uh, they don't want to create a bunch of alts, you know, just to see all the other stuff. So uh, I don't know. Personally, I think it sounds like a, a good idea. I'm kind of curious uh, what it'll be like. Uh, but anyway, that is on the radar. Uh, next up, we have an article by B.K. Koya of CBR.com, the world of comic books, I guess. Uh, but she has posted an article there called Why Dungeons and Dragons Panic Gripped the 1980s. So you might have heard about this. Uh, you know, I talked to a lot of uh, younger folks who play D and D. They have no idea what what this is all about. Like <laughs> satanic panic. <laughs> what the heck are you talking about? Uh, but others, you know, like me, we grew up hearing about this stuff. James Dallas Egbert the third. What a name. Uh, Chris Pritchard. You know, there's basically some. Uh, you know, some stuff went down. It got hyped up beyond the. <laughs> just all. I mean, it's incredible what they uh, what they tried to claim about D&D, &D, and they had a lot of uh, hype around that. A lot of uh, parents forbid their kids from playing it because of this stuff, which really, really sucks. Uh, you know, a lot of that is kind of old hat, but I like this article because it points out a few things I didn't know or hadn't heard before. Uh, for example, Tracy Hickman, 
one of my favorite authors. He did, uh, along with Margaret Weiss, did the Dragonlance Chronicles uh, and the Legends. I mean, those are some of my, my favorite books, period. Uh, but anyway, this article points out that Tracy uh, is a devout Mormon. Uh, so he was, you know, very upset by the satanic panic stuff, and he actually wrote an essay about it, trying to get players to invite their parents and their pastors, you know, to play some sessions with them just to kind of see firsthand. <laughs> you know, this is what I've been doing. You can see it's perfectly harmless. I thought that that was kind of a fun little, uh, little note there about Tracy. Uh, but anyway, you can read the article over at CBR.com. And then uh, finally, some fun toy news. So if you grew up, if you're like me, you grew up and every Christmas, you know, you'd be your, your birthday. I got a birthday not too far off. You know, I'd be like, <laughs> I want all the latest uh, uh, G.I. Joe and Transformer, Transformer toys. I mean, those were, I think, <laughs> some of the best toys ever, really. I mean, awesome stuff. But, you know, lately, I guess if you got some kids, maybe you wanted to buy some of these toys for your kids, you know. And your, your old ones are probably gone by now. Maybe you would just like to have them again uh, for collectible purposes or just for display, you know. Uh, anyway, the good news is they are, Hasbro is coming out with some new uh, toys that are basically retro-themed uh, to sort of fit that, fill that need. For G.I. Joe, they've got some, the 3.75-inch figures from the 80s. And they've got some vehicles, the AWE Striker. <laughs> <laughs> the H-I-S-S -S tank. Uh, and they're also doing some pretty cool stuff for the Transformers line too, Transformers Generations War, for Cybertron packs. So these are basically these collectible packs you can pick up. Optimus Prime, Soundwave. You know, it's a, everybody loves Soundwave. Come on. <laughs> and a lot of other awesome stuff. Uh, so I know this is kind of far beyond the pale of uh, Matt Chet, but I know a lot of people like me were kind of nostalgic for the 80s. Uh, so these, these are things I think you could pick up just for yourself to have as a collectible. Or, of course, you know, if you have some kids, nephews, nieces, whatever, uh, these would be pretty fun, pretty fun gifts. A way to connect, you know, across the generations, as it were. Uh, so I think that's really cool. All right, let's wrap it up with a quotation. And I was uh, thinking about comedy, and I was looking at some of the great classic comedians. I mean, like the real <laughs> old school comedians. And one of the oldest ever is George Burns. <laughs> <laughs> and of course he's just got tons and tons of great quotes uh, but I really like this one it goes something like this this is George Burns you can't help getting older but you don't have to get old so ponder on that and see you guys next time Conditional Blue Perfect Subjunctive.